mistake um because yeah uh, you know i do get fatigue in my hands when i'm drawing sometimes but you know it, it doesn't sort of manifest itself in any kind of interesting way it just looks like i'm not drawing very well um so that's disappointing uh Another aspect, um, and actually something that's been uh, particularly rewarding about this whole process is that uh, some of this work has actually enabled me to uh, reach out to communities who are directly involved in multiple sclerosis, both to other patients and to clinical communities. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's just, obviously it's, you know, in, in talking through all of this, it's an incredible privilege that I am able to use my activities as an artist and as a researcher to address these, you know, deeply kind of personally resonant and meaningful aspects. You know, fundamentally, I'm I'm, I'm able to use um, large chunks of my career as kind of a coping strategy to deal with this. I mean, and that's you know, very few people when they receive this kind of kind of diagnosis get that sort of opportunity. So, I mean, yeah, that that's a wonderful thing. Um, but yeah, and perhaps particularly wonderful is the fact that I've been able to directly share this with people to whom it's relevant. So on, on the right hand side, I, um, I depict myself receiving an email. Um, so as I say in the caption at the top, you might have read it while I've been talking. Um, my own neurologist who was depicted in that, that slide of diagnosis um, a couple of slides ago and, and who now actually owns the original of that drawing, a colleague of his brought it for him as a, a present to celebrate his promotion to professor. He's, you know, I've, I've, so I've, I've shown him these comics. He's been incredibly supportive. It's directly kind of enhanced the quality of, of care that I receive. Uh, from him and from the neurology team. And as, as I talk about in the caption here, he invited me to blog about this stuff um, for a blog that they write and that that led to other people getting in touch. And, um, you know, one something I was really delighted by was another neurologist who I've had no direct contact with uh, saying, look, I, I'm a neurogastroenterologist and I teach training neurologists and I would like to use your comics in teaching them about the importance of understanding patient experience. And it was just like, like yeah, that's what more could you ask for? Like this, this stuff is directly being used to hopefully have some small effect on improving people's lives. You know, that's just fantastic. Um, so sort of, oh yeah, sorry, um, just quickly about that publication. Um, it was originally conceived in collaboration between ARIAS and the Listening Across Disciplines group at LCC. So although my postdoc was at LCC, uh, I have no direct connection to this group, but um, ARIAS emailed this week to say that they will be sending everybody two contributor copies. And they quite specifically said, um, please pass your second copy on to somebody who might be interested in contributing contributing to a future publication. Uh, I should also say that um, all of the other contributions in that publication were purely textual. Mine was the only piece of kind of practice artistic research in, in the publication. So seeing as I'm talking to colleagues and indeed students, um, if anybody does think that um, contributing to a future publication from this organization is of interest, get, get in touch and you know, you can you can have my second copy. Um, OK, so uh, yeah, so another thing sort of practically that came out of that. Um, so I was contacted last year by the MS charity MS UK, who invited me to write about my practice. And this came out just before Christmas. Um, they, they ran the story over a full three pages and in the editorial blurb said, oh, we've, we've got a story from the ins inspiring real life example, John Myers. So I was like, oh, I mean, I'm an inspiring real life example. I didn't know that. How nice. Um, OK, I'm going to skip over these last couple of slides from an in progress project in the interest of time and as promised, we'll uh, kind of loop back to what I was doing in this theoretical chapter. Um, so yeah, so again, this this is um, a relatively recently completed piece of work and it seemed like a nice place to end and also kind of a, a nice a nice point on this journey that I've been describing because it you know, every, everything that I've shown in the last few minutes was you know practical work that had a theoretical backing um but actually so the the brief for this chapter was to first of all introduce an art historical context explain how it's relevant to comic studies and then 
discuss a practical project in which you've explored this context. So, so this gave me the opportunity to kind of bring my practice back to theory. And rather than talking about how my practice has been informed by theory, try to make some suggestions about how, um, how my practice might continue to inform theory as it develops. Um, and so what I was particularly interested in here was uh, the way that in, in comic studies, um, particularly influenced by my colleague Simon Grennan at the University of Chester, there, there's a, a strong sort of line of argument developing in which we, 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 see, we see depiction as kind of inherently producing narratives. Um, so these two images used by Gombrich and Wittgenstein on the left, um, they're used in their books to basically to make theoretical points. Um, but that does not explain why are they so radically different in style? Um, so you know, Gom Gombrich, as an art historian who likes getting into the details of images, it kind of makes sense that he would want to use a version of the image that has more visual material to get your teeth into, because you know, that's the story that he is telling. That's the story that underlies his use of this depiction. Whereas Wittgenstein is not interested in details of drawing style, is not really interested in the practical stuff of drawing. He's interested in how we make concepts of the things that we see. And so again, it, it you know, when we look at the story of what Wittgenstein wants to do, it makes perfect sense that he would reduce that drawing to its basic schematic elements so that he can ignore all of this stuff about style and say and and just say, just focus on the concepts, because that's what I'm interested in. Um, so although these are theoretical examples, there is a story behind them, and that story is implied by the style of the diagram that they choose. So in my case, um, you know, I've, I've already said that my adoption of the styles of Brunetti and Bayer in my comic, those styles in themselves kind of create a way into the story. And so, so as, as a sort of final question at the end of my chapter, I said, all right, well, you know, what use would characters in Mark Bayer's world make of this duck rabbit illusion? And uh, well, actually, characters in Mark Bayer's world are just kind of constantly dealing with the torment of existence. They don't have the psychological space to engage in philosophical argumentation. And so if they're looking at this duck rabbit, they're going to see it basically in terms of personal tragedy rather than in terms of kind of philosophical points about depiction. And so that was kind of the point that I was making in my narrativization of this example. Um, and yeah, OK, so sorry, I know there, there was a, quite a lot of dense theory there. You know, it, it took me 7000 words to get to that point in the actual chapter. And obviously I've done that very, very quickly there. But I hope that was um, relatively coherent. Um, and uh, that's it from me. Thank you all um, very much. Thank you very much, John. Really, really fascinating. Um, and I'd like to open the floor to, to questions now. Um, people can put their hand up. They can type something in the chat. Um, they can unmic and shout out if they prefer. Although hands up is good. Anybody have a question? Nicola, you have your hand up and your camera on. Hi, <laughs> yes, you can always rely Hi, on me to come <laughs> jumping in. Um, yeah, nice to see you again, John. I think we last saw each other on the um, picket line. Um, yes, I, I didn't. Um, I, I did see you in the the union meeting this week, but I, I didn't have oh, my. Yes, yes, yes. You, you would have uh, seen my avatar, though. I didn't turn my camera on at all. Um, but yes, good, good to see you. Yeah, yeah, good to see you again. Um, yeah, I really, um, I'm thrilled by your work, and um, I have me, and I do a lot of draw, and I have PTSD, and I do a lot of drawing, cartoon type drawing, that is not um trained drawing mm -hmm. um about these experiences and um the experience of the, the uh, oppression and the dislocation and the pressure and torments that are sort of accompany living with these conditions in a world i don't think there's anything wrong with having these conditions it's the world that makes it so hard 
Um, and um, so I have a very, like you, a politicised sort of approach to it. And um, I think one of the things I would just ask is very quickly if you might be able to um, list some of the organisations and acronyms and explain them that you you sort of gave very quickly through um, so that I can look because I I think they're very very relevant to my work and you know I'm really singing think with what you're talking about and talking about using your career and your writing and research to understand your own condition in the world understand your own position and understand um the world's approach to mm. disabled and um so on so i find this really thrilling and inspiring i think your work is inspiring it's very informative it's giving me um a theoretical frame not uh, a kind of a theoretical place and practical place um, to help me to sort of understand what I'm doing. So that's been amazing. Um, I suppose uh, I've got so many questions I wouldn't know where to begin. It's more of a conversation I'd like to yeah, have. Yeah, no, so. absolutely. <laughs> um, so um, I would just like to hear more about what you're doing and connect are you at kingston yes yes i am i am at kingston um so my i mean yeah i, I do a bit of work elsewhere but kingston's my main job um that's my yes know, my my, my, my uh, professional home as it were um, yes um can i just ask then um i mean i use a lot of words and images but i don't always call it cartoon i suppose i call it visual mm visual text um and my work isn't always have figures in it it doesn't always have people in it it might just have shapes and things so um i would like to know whether you have looked at other forms of visual uh drawing and expression that is less cartoonish um yes yeah absolutely i mean i, I guess so so i sort of you know identify quite strongly as a cartoonist because of you know i've just i've been a comics nerd all my life and that's you know so i identify very strongly with you know that particular art form that that particular group of cultural traditions and that's just you know um yeah but um yeah but of course i i, I do try to take a sort of broader view of that and um one i was, I was gonna say I sh i'll send i should send you um the full article from uh so the the ms uk the new pathways article mm. i mentioned um because actually the uh in that article the the editor asked me to include some mentions of you know what obviously be, being aware that most people who read that are not necessarily going to consider themselves artists of any type. I mean, you know, the, the, the thing that brings together the readership of that magazine is that they either have or are caring for somebody with multiple yeah. sclerosis. Um, and so there was a couple of things I mentioned in, in there. One, one is a website called Drawing Out, um, which I Drawing I'm, actually let me let me just look it up. I'll drop a link into chat. Um, and uh, what they do is, yeah, it's not cartooning. Um, they talk about it, the use of uh, visual metaphor uh, as yes. a way of kind of conceptualizing. Actually, what I mean, it's in a way it's more relevant to ME than it is to MS because it's specifically about invisible diseases. Um, yes. And, and of course, I know, I mean, I, I have some sort of, uh, I have some colleagues in, in the world of comics and illustration um, who who suffer from uh, ME. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm quite aware that, you know, what actually, you know, you're talking about sort of, yeah, the, the social model society being the thing that disables us rather than the impairments we have ourselves and I, I know that one of the huge challenges facing the me community is is just getting the disease recognized is, is just getting it recognized people don't believe you they yeah. just don't believe yeah. you it, oh you look quite you look well oh how good yeah oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Abs absolutely um 
and and you know and and the sort of uh, you know the kind of value judgments that can go along with it so i mean you know even things i know you know one one of the like with i mean obviously ms is kind of widely recognized and you know ms has thing you know so has visually observable symptoms um but you know a lot of the time i do look fairly i mean i'm lucky that you know so far um you know, I'm, I'm I'm still sort of independently mobile and stuff, and obviously long may that continue. Um, yeah, I do often use a walking stick, which is a, a vi- you know a visual thing. But you know, one of the key um, symptoms of MS is fatigue. Now that becomes much harder to justify because it's uh, you know I eat lunch and 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 then go God, I could really do with a nap now. And it's like, how do you explain yes. that that's not just laziness? Where, where you know? are you going to go for that as well if you're at work? You know, that, indeed. The, the um, access for people with what is now understood as energy impairment, which mm, could come mm. from cancer or any other, you know, the fatigue that comes from all sorts of conditions, um, is now there's a um, energy impairment is the new concept. And there's nowhere to go and lie down and have a sleep at Kingston University. No, no, absolutely. And, and that's a basic piece of access that, um, you know, when I've asked about it, people just sort of half smile as if I'm joking, <laughs> you know, as if it would be, why, yes, ha, 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 ha. Um, no, I'm serious, I yes. need to go and have a sleep. No, no, I, I, absolutely, I mean, I'm, and, well, of course, and, I mean, I, mean, I guess that's the thing, though, it's, it's easy for me to say, I understand because you know I have direct you first experience of, of things like that. Office, it's like the disability yeah. office just says yes. Oh, we don't. We're not aware of anything. Oh mm. well, could mm. you make something happen? Um, anyway, I'm rabbiting as usual. So no, I'll no, shut up. So, so I was just going to say. So um, I've, I've put a couple of links in chat. Actually, these these were um, two of the sources oh, that I mentioned in that article. So, yeah. So drawing out, as I said, so this is very much aimed at you know at, at anybody you, you know not non artists and uh, yeah the whole the whole idea is um, it, so it's grounded in the same kind of metaphor theory that I was you you know that I was using in my PhD that I continue to refer to in my research. Um, and the the idea is about uh, using visual metaphor to try basically to try to explain um, what you're going through in particular. I mean, I, I find this kind of stuff useful myself, but in particular, they phrase it as being valuable for people who have what they what they term as invisible diseases. Um, and yes. so yeah, it, it's not specifically about you know, making comics or making cartoons or anything like that. It's just sort of drawing as a way of processing, a way of coping more broadly. And the, the second link under there is the Drawing Together archive by um, Graphic Medicine. So, I mean, Graphic Medicine is a kind of growing branch of the medical humanities, and, and the term Graphic Medicine refers specifically to the use of comics in healthcare, um, whether that's people doing stuff like I've done, like, you know, people with illnesses creating comics or the other example I referred to where a neurologist is actually saying, I'm going to use your comics as part of teaching trainee doctors. That would also count as graphic medicine. So yes. although although the term itself is quite focused on comics, um, the particular page that I've linked to is the archives of their drawing together meetings. So this was something that they started doing over Zoom during the pandemic and um, so the people involved in those meetings generally do tend to be kind of professionally or personally interested in comics but the results of those um, meetings are just drawings and this was just kind of a community building thing so uh, you know obviously we all found our own ways of coping with with isolation during uh, the various long periods of lockdown um and and so what they did was i mean actually i personally didn't didn't get involved in many of these but it's it's lovely that they've made the archive of all of it available and it is a really wonderfully supportive community. I mean, I've, you know, I've been at their conferences and, and things, um, have, have a lot of good friends in that community. Um, and basically they would, they would get together on a Sunday and, and they would just do drawings together and would share those yes. drawings. And there, there would be a theme for the drawings each week. And it was kind of nothing, nothing more sort of intellectually rigorous or substantial than that. Um, yes. But I, I mean, it's just, a, but again, a sort of a lovely example of how this kind of use of practice um you know has you know has well-being benefits 
Well, I did have uh, my trauma therapist did actually ask me to give her permission to share my drawings with her colleagues um, at the hospital. And I have done some writing for the uh, Action for ME uh, journal. So um, I'm very interested. This is really helpful, um, really interesting. I'll look at these with you know great enthusiasm and uh, I'll, I'll drop you an email. So thank you yeah, very do, much. Do. Oh, and actually, I'm just going to put in one more. Actually, this this is not a web link, but um, but the person I was um, Paula Knight, um, who's a British um, illustrator and cartoonist. I mean, and it, actually, it's um, unfortunately her career. I mean, she suffered, She has not only ME but also endometriosis, and she's basically been bedridden for uh, most of the last two years. Um, but if you'd find her website, um, I mean, you know, she's She's quite active in advocating for ME, and uh, there's a section of her website called Chronic Creations where she's again done drawings where she. Love that. Yeah, Chronic again, creations. they're not. Yeah, um, I mean, and again, they're not. She, I mean, she, she's. I mean, it's 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 awful because she was actually, you know, very successful as an illustrator and cartoonist. Um, published a wonderful graphic memoir a few years back. Um, and, and hasn't really been able to do any substantial projects since then. Um, but yeah, she has got some more recent illustrations on her website um, where she tries to to use them to kind of, yeah, again, just to just to conceptualise what she's going through. Um, yeah, that's so. brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I um, I have a, a question if uh, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to formulate it. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to come out, but I, it kind of struck me that you're working on metaphor, but then mm. the process that you've chosen to adopt of kind of using other people's styles almost has a kind of metaphorical element to it as well. You said it was a way into the story and yes. you know, if describing something as something else in language or, or imagery is is a metaphor. It's, there seemed to me that there was a kind of a mirroring there in your process. Is that something that you were aware of or that that was no, 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 that 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 is done. Yeah, very. That's done very consciously. Um, um, so, so actually, I'm I'm delighted by the question because I because it sort of reassures me that the uh, maybe some some of the more complex bits of the uh, of my presentation did make some sense at least. Um, because I know that I mean that's kind of I exactly the point that I was that I was making in my adoption of the styles of those other artists. I mean, partly it's, that's always been something I've been interested in and, and sort of, change, you know, trying to at, at times quite quite kind of radically change my drawing style depending on the project that I'm working on. Um, but yeah, I mean, and again, this I mean, this sort of builds on you know, ideas that have already been circulating in comic studies. There's you know, this idea that, um, you know, that the drawing style kind of defines the nature of the fictional world that you're going to enter. Um, but yeah, I mean, so if we, if we think of the so the, the sort of traditional linguistic idea of metaphor that, OK, we take one term and we place it in a non-literal way into a sentence and it kind of reframes the meaning that we might have of that sentence. I mean, yeah, I would say that you know, applying another drawing style uh, in my comics in that way has that same effect. So it's like, so if you, if you see a caricature of myself that is drawn in the style of Ivan Brunetti or in the style of an underground cartoonist, um, that it carries with it the associations that we would have with that style of cartooning, which is that that, you know, we would expect that the story is going to be funny we would also expect that the story is going to have some kind of transgressive content. Um, it's probably going to have a bit of bad language. It's probably either going to have some, you know, some scatological or some sexual or, or, or at least some countercultural content, because though, you know, those are the kinds of narrative frameworks that are, that are signified by that style. And of course, that depends on whether or not you have the existing cultural knowledge to, to make those connections with that style. But then, you know, that that's true of any metaphor, if, you know, you know the word, obviously, you know, words don't mean things in themselves. They mean they mean what we've learned they mean. And the same is, I guess, true of drawing style. Um, so, so, yeah, absolutely. It's um, uh, I mean, I, I suppose I'd say with with the Mark Bayer stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think any, you know, anybody who's familiar with 
say the context of outsider art would look at those drawings and go oh this has got a bit of an outsider art feeling to it um which, which again would sort of give us the idea that you know, of course so much of outsider art is used to process trauma um or is used to um to maybe express kind of a a distance from mainstream society or something like that but but i suppose in in that i would argue that there are kind of perceptual effects as well i mean i mentioned again very briefly in in the talk that one of the one of the signature features of bayer's style is these the sort of really exaggerated kind of vertiginous perspectives that that often are spatially incoherent in terms of you know, you know what they create on the page um and and so perhaps on on a more purely perceptual level like you you look at those drawings and you're sort of like I can't quite work out where things fit together in this pictorial space that you've created um and and so again sort of with metaphor theory I would argue that you know if you're if you're looking at a physical space and thinking I don't quite get how things fit together in this physical space that that kind of metaphorically that translates to reinforcing this meaning of like, I don't quite get how things fit together emotionally or psychologically in in this kind of broader space of life that I've been dragged into by this diagnosis. I think that that's I think that's really interesting and and because I've done I've done some work around linguistic metaphor and you know mm. the the idea there very much is that metaphors are a very far from being only the reserve of kind of poetic language they are a very efficient way to capture an idea and 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 particularly those kind of in, more intangible bit around the edges bits of an idea that you couldn't paraphrase you could have put in into words and and the idea that the style that you're using can kind of evoke all those associations that 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 um, in the same way that a that a metaphor in language might do is um yeah it kind of makes sense to me and yeah. and i'm happy to say that the the field of metaphor study within linguistics is is broadening anyway to say we we can't just start to explain you know mary is an angel type examples we have to start talking about extended metaphors and artistic metaphors and visual metaphors and and so it's kind of really interesting to hear you you talk and and how that might fit into the yeah the stuff that I've read about and um, and seen. No, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I know, I'm. I, I think. Um, so you'll you'll probably be. You know, you'll be familiar with the work of you know George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. Most. I, I don't want to sort of get in, get into talking in in detail about metaphor theory in in a way that would sort of probably exclude most of the people listening. But um, but that but that core idea of um that you know metaphors are not this kind of linguistic special effect that are the preserve of poets um this idea that actually metaphor is is rooted in not only our everyday language but actually our everyday cognition like this is this is absolutely central to the more kind of cognitive approaches to metaphor um and actually to take I, um when you were describing that just then you you used the phrase to capture an idea um and i thought like just there were probably countless examples in the last few minutes of conversation but there is an example of something that you know probably didn't feel like a metaphor when you used it probably didn't sound like a metaphor to anyone listening but actually when we think of it of course you can't literally capture an idea an idea is not a tangible thing you know capture refers to you know i've, I've right i've got that you know in its literal meaning we we capture an animal or a you know a, a runaway criminal or something like that you know i mean and this is this is how metaphor works it you know it's it's a term that ordinarily refers to something tangible and something physical but we we just so readily apply this to the abstract and you know one of the key um you know ideas are so abstract that we can't we kind of can't talk about them directly like we we you know we we almost have to use metaphor to even talk about ideas um that's yeah, yeah again that that's kind of part of this theoretical framework I'm drawing on. But but also there are lots and lots of words probably like capture that we use metaphorically much more often than we use literally. And and of course there's also the there's kind of a, a history of of metaphor being used in language to discuss trauma and, and illness mm -hmm. as well. That's a very kind of there's a lot of work ar around that. So to to shift that into the visual area is is again yeah really super interesting. Um, to me. 
Uh, there's a few more, there's a few comments in the, oh, in the chat, um, interesting and inspiring. They say you, you were doubting your inspirational um, credentials, but <laughs> <laughs> got some comments there. Um, any other questions or comments anyone would like to add? You can put your hand up. Nicola, is your hand up still or again? <laughs> Neither. Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, any other questions? Rachel. Oh, hi, Rachel. Hi. Hi, I was lurking. <laughs> um, yeah, wonderful to hear. I think I've heard a, a version of this before, but it was really nice to kind of listen to it again. And um, I think uh, listening to it in relation to kind of illustration research, which sort of aligns with comic studies, but somehow seems sort of adjunct in many ways. But and often um, discussing style within illustration is perceived as something that we should avoid and has been for a while so it's really nice to hear you and unpacking of style. Style's often been uh, considered a kind of uh, um, kind of innate capacity of an individual to produce a particular way of working kind of like an authorial genius that they must protect at all costs um, literal costs like money and clients and things. Um, so I was just thinking about you um, taking on these kind of or other people's personas almost and you talk about them in relation to a genre like underground comics but I was wondering like whether you felt like you were taking whether that was just a genre type um, persona or something of those actual individual people they all happen to be male I think all the comic book yes. artists you, know, you were well, I, presume, I don't know I was just wondering if there's something of that that you felt yeah, okay, no, that's really, um, so. Um, yes, they they are all with, with the exception of Lindsay Cooper, um, who uh, who I, I didn't talk about very much. Although, of course, she, of of all the people depicted in those images, she was the only one who's not a visual artist. Um, she was she was a musician. Um, but actually, there there will be more um, there will be more coming uh, based on her because actually she uh, at LCC um, they had a. A really big archive of her stuff and um as you say, I feel like I know her quite well because in that archive was um two years worth of her personal diaries um and these were diaries that were written um uh, just a few years after she'd been diagnosed so you know I had this you know incredible opportunity to read in you know immense detail how she'd coped with with MS. Um, so th those kind of simple drawings that um, I had of her on that one slide, that's because, yeah, she wasn't a visual artist, but she she's one of those, you know, she was kind of good at art at school and she and she still doodled. So there uh, in the archive, there were lots of her sketches and, and they were in that quite sort of schematic style, which is why she's drawn in that way. But yeah, all of the other cartoonists um, that I looked at are yeah, they are all male. Um, so to some extent, that is because um, that's what's in the collection. You know, it was it was part part of the basis of the residency was you know you need to be using the work that we've got here to create your your new work. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, there is, and yet most of the most of the work that Les Coleman collected um, was by male cartoonists although having said that um, you know kind of he has a lot of early feminist comics as well I mean I suppose more broadly the you know the the history of comics whether it's underground or mainstream it has been quite male dominated um, I guess in that sense it's uh, what I was kind of interested in or getting at was like when, when you talk about you talk about it as like a stylistic genre that you're taking on and you're using the kind of um mm. the way that we interpret that that genre rather than the way that we might interpret that individual like authorial voice of that one person and I was one and I was just wondering right. whether, like finding particular affinity with that particular person or what it, or was that what you were doing or was it just taking on the genre of because yeah, that so, gave you a certain sort of type of visual language rather than like the really specific voice of one person that you mm. could like take on as, as their character, almost like an actor or something. I so I get a, a bit of both. So, I mean, I, I guess I'd say, I mean, you know, it's 
So if, if we think about, say, the difference between how style is treated, perhaps in sort of illustration theory compared to comics theory, um, is that you know, in, in general, there is uh, an established approach in comics theory that does see style as something that is kind of shared across a range of artists. So, I mean, so if we think, for example, I'd say in, in the Franco-Belgian tradition, like the, the, the clear line style that develops from the work of Hergé, the creator of Tintin, um, although he, you know, he's seen as the originator of that style, but that style is not seen as something that belongs to him. It's seen as a style that actually is kind of fundamental to a, a whole tradition of comic storytelling. And then we can say similar things about, you know, th there is kind of there is kind of a style of, say, superhero comics. Um, and that absolutely is not to say that all artists who draw superhero comics look the same, but there are sort of shared features that we can recognise across the vast majority of superhero comics, and they they might be to do with a certain sort of uh, there's a kind of bombastic neoclassicism that runs through all of them, and and all artists working in that genre will share that to some extent. Um, so on that level, like for example, what I was saying about Brunetti is that. Um, so there are features of his style that we could also identify. I mean, if we're talking about underground comics, I guess the obviously the most obvious example is Robert Crumb. Um, so there are features of his style that we can also say, yeah, Robert Crumb's work also has those features. But then um, in terms of the sort of narrative framework, um, I think I, I hope at least I was responding to Brunetti specifically. So um, in, in that comic that I showed an excerpt from Schizo, I, it's I mean actually it's, it, it, it's not a comic I enjoyed reading because it's like he's it, it's difficult he's clearly processing some really intense kind of psychological trauma in that comic but it's um he's so uh he, he just lets rip with not only self-loathing but kind of loathing for like everyone in the world around him and like some of the stuff like I, I don't know maybe it's maybe it didn't seem so kind of dodgy in the 90s but some of the stuff in that comic you look back on it now and you're like wow that really does not seem okay to make that joke um and and so sort of when i adopted um so when i adopted his style to a certain extent in the way that i sort of scripted myself in that story i adopted a little bit of his persona as well which is that i kind of Made my, basically, I made myself a bit more of a, an asshole than I think I am in real life because I was responding to the way that he does. So, and and in some ways that was helpful because he has this yeah this, this really kind of rude persona, um, and and sort of I adopted this and it was you know, but the thing that I was rude to was like my disease. I was like yeah yeah come on MS you can't you know you so so in that sense so so it's, yeah so I guess visually. I think I was, you know, I, I did look in 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 sort of minute detail at his pages, and I would be looking at it going, okay, how does he shade this type of surface? Or, you know, if he's doing a composition this way, how does he do the corners or whatever? So there was that just kind of really sort of tedious, like listing the inventory of his style. Um, and so, although it's got this kind of generic underground comics thing, there there are aspects of it that I think did respond very specifically to him. And in the case of Mark Bayer, I would say that, like, yeah, I guess it depends where the artist fits in. I mean, there really aren't any other comics artists whose work looks like Mark Bayer's. I mean, he really is um, kind of an original in that sense. I mean, it, it looks like outsider art in more generally, but it does not fit into any tradition of comics illustration. And so, so the work I did responding to him, I would say, yeah, that that is definitely a response to that particular artist and not to any kind of wider genre. Thank you. Um, it's a couple of minutes to the hour, so um, we'll close the session now. Thank you ever so much, John. We can all give a little um, emoji round of applause. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, if we could all uh, thank John, virtually waving, put it in the chat, whatever. And um, hopefully um, you enjoyed the session. We have a a session next Wednesday, um, which uh, information has been circulated around where the creative writer Joanne Lindbergh will be talking about her recent work, which explores um, autism uh, and feminism. Uh, so there's 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 um, 
details about that on the Kingston events page if you haven't had an email about it already. So hope to see some of you there. Thank you all very much and um, enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon. Thanks everyone. Um, th thanks for the invitation, Kate. Thank you.